Hi, this is Ginger, and what we're going to be painting today is over a um, already background canvas. In other words, this is a little 6 by 8 canvas that I just had some dried yellow paint on. Sometimes what I'll do is when I have time, I will, um, if I have a little extra paint, I'll just paint an extra white canvas so then I have something to paint on. Now, we happen to be traveling, and so what I'm, what I'm painting on now is we're going to be doing this Monet uh, still life. And it, I thought this background really lent itself well. I think his background was probably more of a beige, but this kind of works. And so right now, what we're drawing is an oval uh, canvas. And, uh, I'm sorry, an oval table on the canvas. And uh, I'm sitting here, and I've got the gouache out. And I've had been painting something else, so I have some paints out. But basically... The colors we're using in this are the colors we use in all our videos. So, you know, burnt umber, a little burnt sienna, um, some blues, probably a thalo blue and ultramarine blue if you were painting this, white. And you have the choice. You can either use Payne's gray and white, like a black and white, like he did, because, of course, he painted with black. Or if you want kind of a gray color, you can take cad red medium, ultramarine blue, white, and a touch of yellow and end up making a gray, kind of a blue-gray color. Either one would look very nice with this. At the moment, I'm just sketching in the picture. And now here's the thing. I'm doing it on a table instead of an easel. And because I'm, uh, we're hooked up you know, with the camera, I don't have any way to back up and look at this. So at the very end of the video, what I will end up doing when I get home, and you'll see that, is I'll probably make a few little... Uh, minor adjustments, but know that that's okay. Sometimes what you need to do as an artist is to come back and look at your painting a couple days later. Just take a, I think what we like to call is fresh eyes. Take it, I have fresh eyes. Now the reason that we, I'm using gouache acrylics is A, they travel really easily. We took these on an airplane. Uh, no problem with the, well we didn't carry them on, but no problem in the ch checked luggage. Very easy. Didn't add a lot of extra weight. Probably, um, I mean, they weigh really nothing. And so we we're able to take the canvas, a few extra brushes, the pencils, um, really anything I need. In fact, I think I even um, brought a roll of paper towels that I could bring with me. And then underneath me is just a paper towel I got out of the restroom and uh, on the ship. So this were now. This was this. Um, uh, cruise that we won, and we're on a ship called um, Majesty of the Seas. So was, I think it's the name of the ship we were on. It was a three-day uh, free cruise, and we went ahead. and I said, "Well, we're going to be, you know, shooting some lessons on this. This should be really good. I think this will be excellent." And I think, well, that was the first one. So this was the one, um, you know, that was one of the ones that we did, and. Well, boy, time really um, goes by when I'm thinking about how we're doing things. And i got to tell you that um, it's fun to paint out and about, you know, to take your paints and go places. But generally, it's a big hassle. I think that's what I would tell you. So generally, taking your paints anywhere is a big hassle. And wash dries very quickly which is nice. I don't have a hair, I'm not using a hair dryer sitting up on the ship and, you know, don't have a hair dryer. But I'm looking out the window at a beautiful view, really enjoying myself. In this case, I'm, I'm not on a moving ship, it's, it's in port. And I'm, I'm going ahead and I'm painting, you know, this picture. And I'll notice that when I'm looking at his, the, the, the thing that I want to say about his is I'm very aware of the brush strokes. He had this sort of scribbled, I would have to say it was a very, um, scribbled background. Now the information I have on this particular painting, uh, which I can give you that Monet did, I can give you, the, you know, a, so I, it really appealed to me. I'll tell you what, I thought it was really pretty. And the information, it's actually 32 by 41 centimeters, which, you know, I just know inches, so centimeters means nothing to me, but maybe it means something to you. But I thought it could be done small. I was looking at this thinking this could be done small or large. He painted it in 1876. And it's an oil on canvas, okay? It's an oil on canvas, 1876. But it was done very quickly. Very few brush strokes. 
a lot of smudge brush strokes. So this is a um, so my suggestion, I'm really going to suggest you try this. Try it on at least an 8x10, a little small canvas. See if you can do this easily. See, this is the trick. Try to do this easily. And then if you like how it comes out, then take a bigger canvas, maybe 16x20. You'd really have a nice painting if you did this larger. But you, the challenge for me, and I think the challenge for you is going to be, is that um, there's a tendency to want to do more brush strokes than he did brush strokes. He's got very uh, few brush strokes and uh, in comparison to, you know, say you might do if you were painting something photorealistically and a lot of blending. It's just there is some blending and smudging and then there's just a lot of layers. So that's the trick. You know, his background is really layered and this upper part up here on the right hand side was quite light. So so I, I'm going to just explain one of the advantages of, of of when you go on vacation taking your paints is sometimes you can even do this in a hotel room you know that usually you can just on a desk it doesn't you're not going to damage anything you know don't just doesn't need much water a little glass of water ought to do it for you some most places have um you know towels or something you know, like paper towels or something you can get um either from a public restroom or somewhere and it's very relaxing to paint in a different environment it's also uh it's important to get out of your studio, art studio, and I know it's hard to do, and uh, you know, not not everything is, um, uh, not every vacation is conducive to that. Let's put it that way. But one thing we have on our website, gingercooklive.gallery, is we have a store. Our store allows we have certain videos that you can download that are instructional step-by-step -step videos that do not um, require the internet. In other words, you can watch them. I like if you're on YouTube here, you pretty much have to have the internet in order to see a YouTube video. But if you, you can actually have some that you can purchase for as little as five dollars, and you can download them and even and watch them while you know on vacation, where you may not be hooked up to the internet. Now, luckily for us on the ship, uh, this was on my iPad. I downloaded the um, the photo on to my iPad, so I'm just looking at my iPad to see it. But we did have internet on the ship, but it wouldn't have been strong enough to film anything for you. I mean, we didn't have good enough internet to film this live, but we did. But we did have um, good enough camera equipment to be able to film it, and then have me talk later. Now I could have uh, been talking at the time that I was filming this, but you know, when you're painting in public, everybody wants to come up and say, "What you doing?" So there would have been a lot of that. I think it would have been distractive, distracting. Now. Uh, well, as I follow along here with this, I want you to see that. So following along, I want you to see that uh, the shades change certain parts of this, um, the front of this table. It's just sort of, it almost, it's weird. It's, it's not really a log, but it's a very uh, misshapen table. It's not a perfect oval. His was not a perfect oval. A very rough little, uh, uh, almost like a, you know what it looks like to me? It's like a cheese thing or maybe a cutting board. Maybe table. Table isn't a good enough word for it. Maybe some sort of um, sawn round cutting board. The more you kind of look at that. But he had a lot of, of beiges and browns in this, which is thus why, you know, in this case, the gouache came with black. And um, so I'm just using um, white with that and I put a little blue with it sometimes to, you know, change the color of the grays. And... The secret for me to try to do this without a hair dryer is to move around the canvas. Now, recently it's come up that perhaps you'd be better off painting gouache, say, on a board, like a, you know, like a, a you know, maybe a inexpensive canvas board, um, as opposed to, um, say, a stretch canvas, because uh, if you paint gouache, acrylic gouache, very thick. It could crack if you bent it. I don't know why you'd bend it, and I have not had any experience with it cracking. But some somebody from Jerry's got on the on Facebook the other day, and she did a review on all different kinds of gouache. This is Turner acrylic gouache. I have got the set, um, and I've been on, I've done like about six paintings on this same set, and I have tons of paint left. I mean, it goes a long ways, and it's very high pigment. So I mean, to me, it's a really ideal painting. Um, surface to use. Now, 
it's a little different than your regular acrylics and then it's because it's so over pigmented what we mean by that it has got a ton of of the stuff that makes the bright color the and so the bright colors and so it's very saturated maybe that's what i want to use the better word saturated okay so you've got the saturated pigment and it'll dry very flat so if you want this shinier it's easy enough to varnish you can use a a Liquitex gloss being even varnish and that should certainly and you could also add for instance you could add a little even uh, um, a medium to this like for instance a glazing medium if you wanted to give it a little more la less elasticity uh, because of the polymers that we're putting in there but I didn't find I needed to do any of this I just it took so little paint and I'm using a tiny little uh, ruby satin silver um, a uh, 3 8 inch brush very little paint to create this and I really enjoyed the process of trying to um, uh, you know put his um, kind of vision to work you know a hundred years later and I could see where um, you know what would be really pretty okay so now you've got it now try this okay and here's what I think would be absolutely stunning is that you can buy at the store uh, certain art stores you can buy gesso canvas that looks like it's natural fiber it looks like burlap and if you could imagine painting this on this sort of natural neutral burlap looking canvas that's very very rough and leaving a lot of the canvas showing um, in the background and just very I think this would be really really cool looking um, on that and large, you know, paint it large, be really, really pretty because it looks it looks real old worldly kitcheny stuff. And this is a nice, neat little. This is a neat dining room piece. This is a neat kitchen piece. This would be a fun gift for somebody that um, you know wanted to give them something decorative to put in the kitchen. You could put it in sort of a um, maybe an old barnwood frame or kind of a rustic looking frame, and you know just do it either six by eight like I'm doing it or eight by ten. Keep, keep it kind of small. So that you have more control of your details. You see, right now we're just sort of layering in all these different colors, layering in the base. So well, anyway, we, John and I are, um, we're we're liking the experience of traveling, and we love the idea that we can, um, you know, answer emails. We do art critiques, one you know, every day at breakfast for about two and a half hours every day, even when we're when we're on a holiday or something, we we still keep in track keep track of um, all the emails that come in. I do personal art coaching with our uh, online art academy, which means that people are sending me stuff every day, and and I usually get back to people within a few days. If I don't get back to them in that day, usually th you know three three working days, not counting uh, weekends. The weekends is when most people send me their their artwork for some you know maybe they want an idea, ask me what I think. You know, should they make the tree bigger? How do they get a How do they get a particular color? Um, the suggestions are helpful. I found that most people are very appreciative of the suggestions, and sometimes having someone to give you a second look. Just what am I doing? Um, I love writing back and saying I can't think of a single thing to say. You just were so perfect. And I do that sometimes. This was so perfect. I like it better than what I painted. And sometimes that happens. I mean. I can show you a technique, but you know you're looking at maybe you're looking at a still life that I'm looking at, and you're going to see something I don't see. We all don't see the same things. Here's an example of that. The one of the things that I've read the police are not real fond of is eyewitness testimony. You have four people that have looked at the same accident. You have four different stories about what happened, and you've got to imagine that you're going to see colors a little differently than I'm going to see them. I'm going to see something gray, and maybe you see it differently. That's okay. This is why it's important to do values rather than colors. And what we mean by that is whether something is darker or lighter than something else. Because if you have, say, a dark green and you have a dark brown, while you're looking at the color version of that, yes, this is true, it is a, um, you can see the difference. When you turn it into a black and white picture, you can't tell because value-wise they're too close in the grays. So one of the secrets, really, for a successful painting any, for any artist, if, if, no matter where you are, is to every once in a while just stop, take a black and white photo, 
of your picture and then of the what you're uh, duplicating and look to see if you have your lights and darks in the right places because sometimes um, you can't um, you really can't you know you don't have it so you you don't have the the uh, values in the right place and you want your lightest light to be around your center of interest so then someone will say well okay what do you mean center of interest well in a still life, the center of interest obviously is the apples, and the um, apples are the probably the main thing, and the vase, and the knife is sort of pointing toward them. So we have like what we would call a triangular picture pattern, but it's really a portrait. Still life is kind of a portrait, it's particularly a simple one like this of apples and a knife, and this glass um, uh, hobnail vase. We used to call those hobnail vases. I don't know what you guys used to call them. That's what we used to call them. So. So then you sit there and say, you want where you want the eye to go, you can see on his that the apple with the white, when we start putting in the white of the apple and a few of the little light dots um, almost on, uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the actual vase to create that sort of hobnail glass effect, okay? That really is what's going to bring your eye toward the center. And I want you to see when we're all done that the knife is never going to be as light, it's light but it's more of a light gray with a tiny bit of white on the edge when we're done. And it's not going to be as bright as the apple. And the apple is going to be brighter and lighter than the actual glass vase. So think of, this is a great uh, painting to just really um, fill in your, um, your lights and your darks and really see the contrast between something very, very light, the vase, which is kind of that way, and the apple and the handle of the knife, which is darker. So here's my first uh, layer of white on the um, on the apple. We've got uh, one that's been sliced in half, and we've got a green apple behind it. So there's actually three apples here, in case you were wondering. There's this one, which is I'm painting now. It's got a tiny bit, it's got a tiny bit of um, warm tones in it. It's not completely stark white, but not quite paper white. And then then we'll have the one on the sides, and there's a kind of a heart shape uh, on the inside of that. And I end up going back later and changing that quite a bit. I didn't quite get it as big as I wanted, so you might want to take a good look at the at the final picture and see what I'm talking about, because I end up changing this heart shape just a little bit. I made it a little bit bigger than um, I initially intent, you know, initially did. So again, we're just layering in the white, putting in a few of the little shadows because it's sort of a it's sort of a dirty white this apple, but it's still bright. And then here comes the other one, and it's lying on its side. So we've got a different plane. And learning how to paint ovals will help you to you know this is um, if you imagine this was a, the apple sort of oval shape, but also you could see it as a as a, a box and almost squared on top too. That might be helpful. So those are, this is our first layers of all the colors. Just sort of layering it in, having got all the lightest in, all the darkest darks, just getting the shapes of everything that I think needs to happen here uh, for a successful painting. And you'll notice that I rinse my brush often and I wipe it out on a little towel. Now this is, uh, if you're not doing that, consider doing that more often. If you're going to rinse your brush, really squeeze it out. Even with acrylic gouache, you want to make sure that you're not over wetting it. You don't really need very much water. This is not watercolor. They're, they do make a gouache that's watercolor. Um, but again, it's more opaque. And it was designed for, and this was sort of interesting to me, gouache was invented, for watercolor gouache was invented, you know, hundreds of years ago. And they and it's got a lot of pigment in it and even even today you'll see illustrators will use it because if you paint say say you're painting a circle and you paint the whole thing in 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 a gouache paint you don't really see the brush strokes brush strokes it kind of it dries very flat in, in, in brush strokes you don't see them it's it's an interesting thing so if you were doing uh, some sort of ad or illustration fashion illustration is another area where gouache is used, um, oh, there's, um, 
though a lot of the greats like Picasso and Monet and stuff actually did use gouache, the watercolor gouache, for some of their stuff. Uh, acrylic gouache wasn't invented until much later, and what and what that did for us. Now, here's the difference between acrylic and watercolor gouache. Acrylic gouache, once it's dry, it's dry. It's just like anything else. Um, watercolor gouache, you can wet and wake it up. In other words, you can you can move it around after it's um after it's uh, dry. But with the, when acrylic gouache is dry, you could you could accidentally, if you put too much water on it, you could maybe, it wouldn't wouldn't wake up as a pain anymore, but you could accidentally maybe remove it if you didn't intend to. So the idea is that, that you, when you when you varnish this, it's it's um, really no different than your other acrylics, okay? And, and you've seen us do it on paper. We also paint on paper, but it works fine on canvas too. It doesn't. I think it's very happy with whatever you want to paint it on. Um, I don't know that I'd paint it, say, on a T-shirt, um, because I don't know that um, it would, uh, unless I was using some polymer with it, because the polymer would bind it. I think it might wash off a T-shirt. I don't know that I would use it for that. You'd sure have to. Uh, I use regular acrylics on T-shirts. Um, I paint my t-shirts all the time, but I'm not sure I would use this on a t-shirt unless I had uh, some medium with it, and then it probably worked just fine. But I don't know if there'd be an advantage to doing that. Uh, uh, this is more, when you're doing, what we're doing now is we're doing small gouache painting studies. I'd say this is a study in a still life, and then you get you get all your stuff just the way you want it, and you know, do a small picture, and then if it, if you're enchanted by the picture, because you're going to learn a lot just by getting all these colors and lights and darks in here. If you're enchanted by it, want to do it again, do it larger. And so, okay, so I'm going to do it larger. How am I going to do it larger? Well, you'd probably use a bigger brush. Don't see the small brush I'm using? If you were doing this larger, your brush might be a um, slightly larger, maybe a quarter inch angle brush, not the three eighths. I might go up a brush size if I was doing it bigger. That would be probably one of the main things I would do differently. And if I was going to do it bigger too, um, let's see, would I do anything else differently? Um, no. Just pretty much the way we're doing it now. I would just do a different brush and make sure that, um, I, in the, would you use gouache if you were doing it bigger? No, probably I wouldn't. If I was going to do it very large, I wouldn't use gouache. You can, I would probably use just regular acrylics, unless I was doing it on a panel. The other thing is gouache paints are fun to use small. They're, they're not inexpensive, even though they go a really long way. So you might like them for highlights. You could go on top of dried acrylics with gouache, and vice versa. So you could add... For instance, um, oh, maybe you wanted a bright, you maybe you're doing some flowers and you want one flower slightly brighter red, you might go into some gouache and see if that didn't look a bit brighter after you varnish it. Of course, it'll dry flat, but they do have very beautiful bright colors. Very, very nice bright colors. Now, some of you guys have asked me, about uh, when we do the live shows. Uh, when John and I travel, we try to put up videos that we think you're going to enjoy, and and we do them the same. We release them the same days we do our live videos, like on Mondays and Tuesdays, usually in the morning. Though so we're usually live at 7:30 Central Time um, when we're we're in town. But when we're out of town and traveling, um, we look for our videos, our Tuesday and Monday releases first thing in the morning. We want to give you a lot of time to paint on them. So that's when you can look for the releases. And if we can, when we're traveling, we'll try to find spots where we can shoot live videos. Just get up on YouTube and shoot them live. If we can find, we don't have good enough internet connection, like I said, on the ship. But sometimes we can, you know, be, when we're in port, we can, uh, you know, find a good signal and maybe do a real fun, interesting live show, which is always fun. And uh, you won't be aware that we're doing that. You might miss it because there wouldn't be any specific time if you're not subscribed. So one of the advantages 
of subscribing for, uh, to our channel is that if you push that little kind of gear knob under there on the right hand side uh, under the picture you can ask that um, you get an, a notification if um, if we're going live so then you don't miss any of these surprise live shows and even when we're home sometimes we'll do a Raz show which is a fly on the wall be a fly on the wall in our art studio we don't always leave those up um, so those are ones where kind of pot luck. Sometimes we're testing out equipment, and I might be painting something. And so what we do is we say, okay, we're going to be doing a live show here, um, and and you'll get a notification of it. And it's really fun because it's just being a fly on the wall in the studio, or maybe it's something we do when we're traveling. So really, if you get a chance, please um, please subscribe to the channel. It's been noted by YouTube that about 50% of of um, the people who watch videos do not subscribe to the channel of the video they're watching. Now we do appreciate it when you subscribe and then the other thing you can do um, is if you say oh yeah I want to watch it but I don't have time. I just don't have time right now to watch it Ginger. What can I do? And I, You put up so many videos I lose it again. It's so frustrating. You have, when you become a member of YouTube you have something on your on your page called a playlist and you can then copy the URL of any video um, you can, I don't even know what the URL is okay it's a, this is long I don't know either it's a long straight string of of words and numbers okay and you find them you copy them when and under the video you'll see it when you hit play and all that stuff you'll see something called share you'll see a, a word called share and if you click on that word then this little box appears and you'll see all these little numbers and letters well you copy that and then you go over to your page okay and you go to your video playlist and you, you say add a video you know a new playlist you know maybe it'll be gingers videos or you know how to fix the refrigerator videos you know give 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 your playlist a title and then make it real easy for you and then what you do is then you open that up and then you add videos and if it's somebody else's playlist like in my case it would be mine you know you would just then paste in that URL number and then you would then have a link to the um, uh, to the video the other thing you can do is it'll give you the option to share it you can share uh, the video when it says it, it has you can share it on Pinterest, on your Pinterest page. Maybe you want to put up a board on Pinterest of videos that I intend to watch later and let other people know that you think they're great. Maybe you have a public board on, on your Pinterest page. So what you do is you say share on Pinterest. You say share and you hit the Pinterest one and then it'll say which Pinterest board. Then of course you have to then tell the computer where you'd like this video shared. So for instance, if you have some favorite still lifes, of videos that you've liked all the time. You could have a Pinterest board of still life videos I want to watch or that I've enjoyed. And you could have a, really some fun with Pinterest. And and um, also you can share it to your Facebook page. Um, it has some different places that you can share the videos besides your playlist on YouTube. So whatever you think would make it the easiest way to find something again. Um, you can it's nice to you know you can like a video and if you hit like on it which is good YouTube kind of knows you liked it but then after a while you have this big long string of like videos and this isn't helpful so if you want to find these things again I don't care which video we're talking about that's that's a good way to do it or if you find a video that you think um, might be good for somebody else you can share them on a friend's page on Facebook for instance you might say you will not believe how good this video is and you can share it with somebody else so that's a good thing and, it, and here's why it's nice for us artists when you share our videos is that YouTube wants to know what you want to watch I mean they're like Big Brother I'm sorry the computer anymore it's like Big Brother they want to know they know what you watch they see what you watch everybody that, that my goodness the computer knows what you buy anymore I tell you don't go popping through um, for instance a Nordstrom's catalog online and be surprised that the next time you're somewhere else online there isn't a little ad saying by the way we saw that you like this quote at Nordstrom's you want to go back and get it and you're going 
how does it know that? Well, it knows these things, okay? So what you want to do then is, um, uh, again, so you're kind of get ahead of the game and, and get more control over what's shown to you. And one of the things where you can do that is to have a playlist. And the thing that I'm starting to tell you that's helpful for us artists is that um, if you put our videos in playlists, they will show them to others more often because it's almost like you voted for it. It's like you voted for it. I mean, a lot of times in the live shows, you'll see where we have a place where you can add donations. We don't on an already filmed video. And, of course, you can always go to our website and donate to our scholarship fund, which, of course, we appreciate. But um, uh, as far as um, the really something that's extremely helpful is to just put these videos in a playlist. It's It makes a big difference. And, of course, we appreciate your likes. And if you have a com question or a comment, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I know there's some people who really miss John when we do these lo when we do these videos. And so, you know, they miss the stories and they miss all the chatting and stuff. And, you know, there's some advantages to the live videos, but there's also some advantages to a video like this where you just kind of watch me paint and um, you can just see how I'm focused completely on adding the lights and the darks to this face. Now we're going into the lighter colors. Remember, in acrylics, you go from dark to light. Um... My adopted mother collected this kind of glass. We had a, a, a window in our, right next to our front door that was inset, and it had about a, I don't know, about a four-inch glass shelves inside it. And she had, went during, uh, right after World War II, they'd gone to Germany because my um, adopted father was one of the judges on the Nuremberg trials. And they were over in Germany, and she ended up buying and collecting this uh, this glass with all these little bumps all over it. I think she called it hobnail glass, and she had, I, she had really pretty colored ones. She had some kind of deep wine colored ones, and some blue ones, and some uh, kind of amber colored glass, and uh, they were all displayed in this case by the front door. I don't think we ever used any of those glasses, and I think later uh, when she. When they got, to, they moved out of the house and into a condo as they got older. I think she sold all those to an antique store. She didn't, um, she didn't offer them to any of us kids, even to buy them from her, which would have been nice. I don't think I would have, but I would have been nice to, to at least ask us first if um, we wanted to buy them. One of the favorite, my favorite things that she bought, brought over from Germany, was she had these wagons that were typical wagons that you'd see in Europe. It's amazing. Well, see, when you're in the military, they'll ship anything back anymore. <laughs> you know, it's free. Just buy all your stuff and they'll ship it back. And so she got a lot of antiques that all got shipped back care of, care of the U.S. government. Because, you know, as a judge on the Nuremberg trials, then he was um, he was then a colonel in the Air Force. To, you know, in order to, he had to be in the Air Force. So he was with the adjutant general's office or something like that. I don't know, something like that. So anyway, uh, she had all this stuff, and she had these really cute um, wagons that uh, had you know kind of slatted sides, and they were uh, the kids used to play in those all the time. They were really sturdy, and I really had such fond memories of these little wagons and them. Um, Maybe the next time I do a live video, I'll see if I can find a photograph of one of them. They were so cute. And she, when they, they moved, she just um, she sold them. And that would have been something I would have at least had liked the opportunity to have um, gotten from her. So, all right. Now, you see what we're doing here is where this, there's a rule in painting. Wherever there's a light, there's a dark. So if you've got something dark, then you need to put a light to it, light color next to it. And if there's a dark, and it's so like this handle, we're kind of um, making the, it's a, there's a dark shadow. Monet has this dark shadow right by the knife. And then, but it's kind of light next to the handle, and he's got a little bit of dark thing. It's, it's interesting to me. And then he's gotten almost a reddish brown kind of stain on the table. So you'll, what you're going to see me do a lot of in this video is just 
keep adding extra colors. Do you see that? It's, it's, oil paints, acrylic paints, it's all about layering. It's never ever about just one thing. So it's a little bit darker on the edge there, maybe lighter there. So I'm just going around looking at his picture. It's deciding where he had it lighter and where he had it darker. That's the whole trick to this. And that's what you need to be doing too. With any painting you're doing. You know, where is it where's my lights? Where are my darks? Where are my values? Just you know, I'm I know you hear me say that enough all the time, in fact. You hear me say that all the time, but I think it's really important. And see how old antique looking this is getting? I love this picture. This is really kind of an old thing. Now, oh, here's something you could do, and you're going, no, what? I haven't done this, but you know what? I ought to do it. When you've got an old painting like this, particularly if you do this a little bit old, bigger, something, and you're painting it with regular acrylics, you know, maybe not with the gouache, but regular acrylics, okay? Um, what you might buy, there's some stuff you could buy called Crackle It. And when your painting is all dry, that's completely dry for a couple of days, you brush that a uh, crackle on, and it does this thin like layer of um, like varnish that uh, you can hardly see it. And it makes these little tiny fine cracks, like something that aged. Then you take a cotton ball and a little tiny bit of um, raw umber, okay, and kind of rub over the entire painting, and it the brown will go into the cracks and cause this some. Um, awesome antique look but you put it on very very thin okay and, and in fact you try it on something else first before you just you know you know totally ruin a masterpiece that you've done you know get a test canvas and just put some colors on it and dry it and put the crackle on it and dry it and then, and then take the, the cotton ball and, and make the cracks and see what happens I think you'd be very surprised and I, we have to do that one day because I think then it looks really old and antique -y. You know, that's this is very country kitchen and really pretty. Just has very fun memories. And of course, green apples have been around for a long time. It's funny. I mean, I was looking at some paintings of artists that were in the 1500s in Spain. Imagine that, 1500s, and they had the same boxes we have, and they their peaches look like ours, and their donuts, even their donuts, look like ours. I'm going. Man, they were eating those donuts that long ago? Wow, some things just never go out of style. Of course, they didn't have any Cheetos or anything, but they had donuts. So you see, here's what I'm doing this. Remember I told you I was going to kind of, you know, bring that up a little bit. And so I'm adding a bit more light now to the, um, to the paint. One thing that's been suggested, and I think it's a very good idea, is that if you have a set of gouache, uh, take a little canvas like that and just um, make some color strips and then add white to some of them. So kind of get the idea of from dark to light, what would happen. Start with the dark and issue, and then add a little white. Make this long kind of color strip, and then just let it all dry, and then label what everything is. So you can kind of see what the colors look like dry. Uh, I think that's, you know, pure out of the tubes. So one, one of the reasons that I'm constantly going over things is that, that um, like for instance, he had some gray in this apple, and he has this sort of blue-gray color that we're doing, you know, and um, I'm constantly adjusting the colors. I'm not trying to be fussy here, but this is one of the tricks of painting. You have something coming out well. This isn't a hard painting to do. I think you could do this easily really think you could, but you want to be able to um, take your time and layer it. So here's a little information while we're painting this about Monet. Um, if I can find it for you. Done. Let me find this our picture, and I will do that for you.
Well, you know what? I love this. I just love this. I'm starting to give you some ideas about Monet, and Monet didn't paint this at all. It's in the Monet Museum. Because I'm sitting here reading the title on the painting, which is called Cut Apple in a Picture, 1876, Oil on Canvas, and it's in the, the Museum of Monet in Paris, and I'm thinking that it's Monet's painting, and you're going to laugh, Ginger, you're hysterical. Well, it's not done by him at all. Okay, so, you guys asked me for some art, some paintings that were done by women. Well, okay, so don't kill me. Here it is. This was done by a Bertha Morissot, M-O-R-I-S-O-T. She was French. Um, she died in 1895, and she was born in 1841. She was a member of the Circle of Painters in Paris who became known as the Impressionists. So, you know, this is a gal that I really haven't... Um, Bertha Morissette was also Madame Eugène Manet. Okay, so let's, let's read more about her. Um, uh, she was in exhibitions with Paul Cézanne, Edric Degas, Edric Degas Claude Monet, uh, Pissario, Auguste, Auguste Renoir, and Alfred Sicily. So uh, she was married to Eugene Manet. Okay, so that Manet was different than Monet. I'm sorry, now I've really got you confused. Uh, Manet, but he was one of the gang, and she was his wife. So she was her own person, uh, Bertha Morissot. And um, uh, she, uh, let's see if we can tell you anything more about her. Um, she was born in Bourges, France, um, and her family was pretty rich. A, a, a fluent bourgeois family. Her father uh, was a um, a prefect or a senior administrator of, with the government, and he also studied architecture at the Ecole de Beaux Arts in uh, in uh, in France. Um, let's see if anything about it. it was common practice for daughters of bourgeois families. Those are the rich guys, right? To receive art education. So Bertha and her sister Eve and Edna were taught privately by Godfrey Alphonse Charnon and Joseph Gissard. Most, Morissot and her sister initially started taking lessons so they could each make a drawing for their father for his birthday. In 1857, now remember their father was a big deal artist, right? In 1857, Gissard, who ran a school for girls in Rue de Moulins, introduced Bertha and Edna to the Louvre Gallery where they could learn by looking and from 1858, they learned by copying paintings, which is how art was taught back then. It's still taught that way today, copying paintings. But, but this gal got to sit at the Louvre and do it. How cool is that? And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Louvre, the Louvre is like the number one art museum in all of Europe. Okay? It's been around a while, hasn't it? So, as art students, Bertha and Edma worked closely together until Edma married um, a naval officer and moved out of town and had less time to paint. Letters between the sisters showed a loving relationship underscored by Bertha's regret at the distance between them. Well, you know, I really always felt bad that I didn't live close to my sister, too, so I get it. Um, Edna wholeheartedly supported Bertha's continued work, and their families remained close. Um, so, I mean, I don't really care that her sister married a tax collector, but the tax collector was painted by Edward Degas, so I guess you get to know this because Edward God paint, painted um, her sister's husband. Well, that's no small thing. And um, uh, she was registered as an official copyist at the Louvre where she befriended other artists and teachers, including Camille Corot, the, uh, the landscaper of the Barbizon School of Art, who also excelled in figure painting in 1860. I mean, these people all hung out, right? Don't you love that? That's why we all want to hang out together at our live shows. We all want to be all hang out together. We'll be people. Maybe one day we'll talk about this. So, um, uh, uh, none of her sculpture is known to have survived, which is sad because she studied sculpture in 1863, but none of her sculptures it, it survived. So, Morissot appeared in the Salon in Paris in 1864. She continued to show regularly in the Salon, which is like this big art show in France, until 1873, before the first Impressionist exhibition. Um, let's see, she... Um, 
1868, she became friends with Edward Manet, who painted several portraits of her. She must have, she's real pretty. If you look at the pictures of her, she's real pretty. Including a striking study of a black veil wife in mourning for her father. Correspondence between them shows warm affection, and Manet gave her an easel as a Christmas present. To her dismay, he inferred with one of the Salon submissions while he was engaged to transport it, interfered with one of her salon submissions, mistaking her self-criticism as an invitation to add corrections. Oh my gosh, she painted on her painting. Oh my gosh, that is such a no-no. I'm surprised she ended up marrying him. Unbelievable. Although Manet is regarded as the master and Morissette as the follower, there is evidence that their relationship reciprocal. Records show that Manet's appreciation of her distinctive original style and compositional decisions, some of which he incorporated into his own work. So basically he was stealing from his wife. That sounds good to me, right? I well believe it. You know, women in those days, um, even today, uh, <laughs> they just don't always get the respect that their male counterparts get, just as sad as it is. But for sure back then, all right? Um, Morissot's work was almost always small in scale. She worked in oil paint, watercolors, or pastels, sketching and using various drawing media. Around 1880, she began painting on unprimed canvas, a technique Manet and Eva Gonzalez also experimented with at the time. Okay, so I was thinking, remember I told you at the beginning of this that I thought this looked like unprimed canvas? Y'all remember me saying that? That you could get that that look, you could buy it and do a painting like this, and I was right. Huh, okay. Among her contemporary art critiques, such as uh, Gustav Godfrey, 1881, Morissot was hailed as no one represents Impressionism with more refined talent and more authority than Morissot. So, you know, she had respect from, from her fellow artists. That's a pretty neat thing, right? Really a cool thing, you guys. Great story. All right. So Morissot painted what she experienced on a daily basis. So she's painting daily. Her paintings reflect the 19th century culture restrictions of her class and gender. She avoided urban and street scenes and seldom painted nude figures. Like her fellow Impressionist Mary Cassette, she's the other gal that we're all familiar with, Mary Cassette, she focused on domestic life and portraits in which she could use family and personal friends as models, including her daughter Julie and her sister Emma. Prior to the 1860s, Morissot painted subjects in line with the Barbizon School before turning to scenes of contemporary femininity. I like that. Contemporary femininity. Okay? So later in her career, Morrison worked with more ambitious themes such as nudes. Corresponding with Morissette's interest in nude subjects, Morissette also began to focus on preliminary drawings com competing many um, dry points, charcoal, and colored pencil. Ah, so now we're going to get down to her personal life. All right, good story, right? Where I'm painting this. I'm so excited that I'm reading the fine print on this stuff, okay? So, Morissot was married to the, Eugene Manet, um, the, brother, the brother of her friend and colleague, Edward Manet, Edward Manet, until his... Okay, so I'm just trying to understand this. So she was married to Eugene Manet. I thought she was married to Edward. Huh, well, apparently it was the... She never actually married... Edward Manet, she married his brother until he died. And then in 1878, she gave birth to her only child, Julie, who posed frequently for her mother and, uh, and other Impressionist artists, including Renoir and her uncle, Edward. Morissette died in March 1895 in Paris of Fomonia, contracted while attending her daughter Julie's similar illness, and thus orphaning her at the age of 16. She was interned somewhere that, in some cemetery that none of us care about, right? Um, oh, there's a film about her, a French film about her. There's a, mo there's a movie about her, you guys. She was portrayed by actress Maureen D E L T E R Beltramy in 2012 French biographical TV film and uh, the character of Beatrice de Cheville in Elizabeth's novel The Swan Thieves is largely based on Morissot. Um, her work sold. She was a, you know, she was selling her paintings. This is a good thing, right? Uh, she achieved two of the highest prices at a hotel auction in 1875, 
the interior, a young woman with a mirror, sold for 480 francs, and her a pastel on the lawn sold for 320 francs, and her works averaged about 250 francs, the best relative prices on the auction. The best relative prices at the auction. So she was up there. She was getting whatever the money was at the time. She was getting serious money for her paintings. And in February, I love this, in February 2013, of course, after her death, Morissette became the highest priced female artist with After the Lunch, which she painted in 1881. A portrait of a young redhead which sold for $10.9 million at a Christie auction. Uh, the painting achieved roughly three times its upper estimate, exceeding the $10.9 million was a sculpture by Louise in, in 2012. So anyway, so there's some different works that you can look her up. Um, let me give you her spelling in case I'm not saying the name right. Bertha, B-E-R-T-H-E, Morissette, M-A-R-M-O-R-I-S-O-T, and you can read all about her on Wikipedia and find out about this artist, who I swear, I swear I'm sitting here reading this saying that she, I thought for sure she was married to the painter Edward, but I guess he was the brother of her, a good friend, and brother of her husband. He was her brother-in-law. So, anyway, that's the story about her. I love the painting. Oh, it's a very neat painting. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm excited about, I think, the idea of doing it on an unprimed, well, it's primed, but the way we buy those canvases today, they look like natural fiber, you know, kind of the brown natural fiber. And um, uh, so, so some of that shows through, and you can buy canvases like that that are, that are archival. The problem with painting on just raw canvas without any kind of primer we have something called clear gesso, um, which you can use. And the, the, the thing about it is is that um, oil paints will rot. The reason they had to prime oil paint in canvas is it'll rot. It, the paint will actually cause the canvas to rot. So I don't know what she put under there to make that happen. But uh, see, I'm kind of holding my picture up there now and making sure I've got... Um, uh, I want to just see it to make sure I've got the you know, correct proportions. Because normally when I'm painting with you guys, I have a, a, a TV where I can, and a, and at a distance where I can see the picture because I can't get up and just go look. So um, now I'm making a few more adjustments, straightening some stuff up. The sides of that, top of that vase, must be parallel to the sides of the canvas. they got to be parallel. So if I don't have that, if i got a little cattywampus or crooked, then I've got to fix it. So at this point, I'm kind of turning it upside down. It still feels... You know, slightly off to me. I'm looking at that and see. I can see where it's slightly off. So I'm just making some a few tiny little adjustments to kind of straighten that out. Well, this was a good. I hope you guys enjoyed the story about her. Great story, right? I know some of you guys like it when we do these old dead guys. But I had, I have to be real honest. I had never heard of her. I know that's terrible, but I really, I I, I knew about um, uh, the other. You know, I knew about Mary Cassette, who was one of the the primary impressionist, but I, I really didn't know about Morissot, Bertha Morissot, and, um, or Madame Eugene Manet, that's what they called her, but she was, uh, she, she was quite a looker. She had, um, they show a picture of her here in 1875 on, 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 on Wikipedia, and, um, she's in this really fancy long dress, kind of a cool looking hat, um, of long gloves. Very elegant gal. Very elegant. So now I feel like I've got to look up more of her artwork. Maybe we'll do more of her stuff. Um, I know that, you know, we'll, I'll look for more of her stuff then. I'm all excited now. We'll, we'll try to find, we'll try to find more of her stuff and see if we can't, um, uh, you know, do some more of her artwork. Because I think this is, I really fell in love with this. I thought this was really pretty. Let's see if we can't find some more of Morissette. And then maybe we'll just uh, do more of her in the future, which would be cool. So uh, that would be a great thing. And uh, maybe we can try that. So I'm going to start looking her up for you guys and see what we've got. So you'll notice that, you know, wherever there's a light, there's a dark. We're still playing with the background a little bit. I'm still holding it up looking. 
making adjustments. This is what we do. You know, I don't paint these first. That's the first time I've ever seen this painting. And um, uh, I just found it, on, you know, on the internet. I, and it was at the right date. And I really did think Monet had painted it because Mrs. Magoo over here with the weird eyes, I thought it was, really thought it was him, but apparently it wasn't. Here it is, Morissette. But her last name was Manet. And it wasn't the Manet Impressionist. It was the brother. All these things. So, um, um, uh, just, we will see about more about her. Bertha Morissette. So, in fact, while I'm talking to you now and showing you this stuff, um, oh, why, word, she was good. Oh, this woman was amazing. No wonder she was selling so well. I'm just, to I'm totally impressed with her stuff. Wait till you start looking her up. She was really good. I love it. She's got this one painting of a, a gal reading a book, and there's this cute little cat, black cat, sitting next to her. And you can, really impressionist, you can barely see anything. And the cat's got these little glowing yellow eyes, tiny little dots. And it is so... I mean, you really don't see anything on this cat. If the cat feels fluffy, uh, this looks like a watercolor to me. I wonder if it was. No, it was um, oil on canvas. But, you know, she was a watercolor, so she had a watercolor style to me, besides being impressionistic. She had more of a watercolor style. She did a lot of portraits. She was very good at that. She was an excellent portrait painter. No wonder she had a cow when uh, her brother-in-law started painting on her picture. Um... That would just uh, put, send me right over the top if I <laughs> someone did that to me. I, I don't get angry very often, but some, if I came back and somebody had been fooling around with my picture, I would be really mad. So, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, we're going to do more of uh, Bertha. Uh, absolutely. Now, it's interesting, her children, they don't show any of her children went on to be famous artists. Or, but the, it all sort of stopped there. This is interesting to me. You know, um, that neither her sister or anybody went on to become famous artists. But I do like, I do like what she painted. And she has a few landscapes in here. Um, the problem I'm seeing with some of them is I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't particularly like the scene. But she's got a great painting. Well, I don't know if it's great. Well, she's got some very nice paintings of um, women and children doing things, which are kind of cool. And, you know, women with umbrellas. Well, they all had these parasols and umbrellas. And, um, it, I, I, anyway, I think we might have fun. We'll, we'll try to do another one of her pictures, for sure. And, um, we'll find something else that you guys would like to do. That more, You know, I like this one because it's not too difficult, even though I've been painting on this for over an hour. You've got to appreciate that all the layers that are in this simple little picture, you'd think you could do this in about 10 minutes. And it really was not a 10 minute painting. But uh, she was a very interesting gal. I, I, I have a few here I like. I like pictures where people are reading books. Maybe because I like books. I like that. And, oh, interesting. I don't think maybe landscape was her best thing, but she's got a, bo a, bo a boat with a you know on a canal. That's sort of interesting. Except I'm not a big I don't know what happened on the right hand side. It got a little goofy. That fun. You can go back and say, well, this is okay, but I don't know about this. And then I've got she's got one such a detailed picture. I mean, it's so detailed of this little girl and a cat leaning up against her. That's amazing. Uh, this girl's probably about thirteen. And that, that's just gorgeous. So she definitely has got some paintings we might want. We, I'm sure I can find something we would like to do. I love it. I think we can find something we'd like to do. And I think we'll do it. Because we've been asked for some more uh, figurative drawing. And we've been you know, asked for um, some more of the women impressionists. So that's kind of a good thing. 
and you guys are noticing I'm not putting out a lot more paint. Do you see how far my paint's going? I'm putting those little seeds in the apple now. I'm putting a few more little little touches. It's interesting how it all builds up. And I kind I think I created the illusion of maybe that kind of canvas that's that sort of that um, off white canvas. I think I've created the illusion of that that's painted on a rough surface, which was sort of cool. And I think I would varnish this. Here's the thing. If you're going to varnish something, you varnish it first with the gloss and then you come back with the matte. And I definitely would varnish it with the, I definitely would varnish this as a matte painting. I would want it matte and want it to look very old. So, wow, well, I can't believe it. I just cannot believe I have I've never found her before because I probably have run across her pictures in looking through the internet for things that I think everybody would like to paint. Um, but I never attributed that to, you know, any one particular artist, you know, because it, her style developed as she, you know, the thing is when someone gets famous, they show you every everything they ever painted. And I hope they, you know, I mean, if I'm dead in a hundred years and they show all the stuff I painted, then people would say, well, huh, because there's always a few huhs in a group like this, isn't there? Ah, uh, for sure. Well, she's got a really nice group of florals, too, we might like, too. But, you know, there's a real pretty, oh, I like this. I might do a floral going, like what? Well, wait till you see it. Like I say, we'll do more of her. I like the floral. The thing about it is some of her landscapes are a little bleak that just, well, whenever I'm considering doing a painting for YouTube, I have to think about what, how will it look like in a thumbnail? And uh, a lot of her paintings are real neutral. And even this one was a gamble whether I was even going to put this up as one of our YouTube uh, videos because it does not have a lot of color. The apple, the bright green apple, is, and it's really a bright green, almost um, not quite golf course green, but it's a big lime, it's a very lime green apple. For sure, and that that's my one touch of color. Though I do go back and add a few little touches here and there. You know I'm going to gingerize everything. A few little touches, but um, they've got about, um, she did about, that they, uh, we have records of that I can find about them, 350 paintings. I ought to be able to find something in this group that you guys all might like and celebrate some female artists. The guys get too much attention. Oh. See, and you're going, what? What are you looking at? Well, I'm just thinking about all the things we could do that would be fun and different that no one else has been doing for a while. And, uh, okay, so the shadows are going in on that. Do you see? That's a, we're building up shadows on this picture. Always building up. So if you figure that I've got about from here, you know, I'm still going to add more things, and it looks done now, doesn't it? But, you know, that's the thing. I always tell people, go away. Just go take your painting. Stop. A, you know, if you're painting this, stop, and then let it dry. Come back in an hour and, and look at it, and then keep going. Give your give your eyes a chance to, your, your eyes a chance to rest, and, and you'll see more stuff. Just walk, get up, walk away from your painting for a little bit and then come back. Uh, let's see, what else can I share with you while we're talking about this painting? Uh, why were, why was Morissette and uh, Monet, Manet and Monet and uh, Degas and Cesaro, why were those guys, uh, Van Gogh, why were these guys considered Impressionists? Well, I think that comes up. I mean, what makes an Impressionist a painter? Well, the thing with this is that up until then, everything was painted pretty much photorealism. If you sat down and you painted, um, and you, for instance, you had a camera, today's camera, and, and you had one of their paintings, the, the paintings up until that time pretty much looked exactly like the object because there were no cameras. You know, when cameras started to become popular, and you could get, you know, about the 1860s, you saw a lot of photographs. We had a lot of photos, of, for instance, of the Civil War, 1865. 
but these guys were painting in the 1860s. Uh, you could go get your portrait taken with a camera. You had access to a camera. You could take pictures of a still life. And so artists were looking at that going, well, photography is kind of ruining it for us. We, can, we now have a photograph, so why does anybody need me? So, and then that was one reason. And the other reason was is that um, paints became available in tubes for people to buy. You weren't making your paints anymore and putting them in a pig's bladder, which looked a little bit like a grapefruit, and filling that up, tying it up at the top, and then squeezing the oil paint out, and then sewing it up at night. I mean, when you had to do that rigmarole to set up your paintings, um, and you had to go to, you know, you had to go to an art school, a pretty fine art school, in order to even figure out how to make the paint. I mean, you had to be a chemist, you had to know how to make your brushes, you had to do all the stuff. So, if you were... Um, if you had to, you know, buy your, mix your paints, that limited your travel. You weren't going anywhere with them. You had to sit there and mix them and take care of them. And so you were indoors. There wasn't electricity. You were working by lamps. So uh, oil lamps probably got, you know, some people had gas lamps later on. So you had a north light. The north light was the window that you had in art studio that where the sun was consistent, the light was consistent wouldn't be throwing shadows in your workroom all day long. So if you were doing portraits, you could put somebody and, and the light could be on them and, you know, that you wouldn't have a, um, you wouldn't have a problem with the lighting because, you you know, candles and, and lanterns were not conducive to um, well-lit subjects. So now you have, the, you have the portability of the paint. Paint started to be sold in tubes and, um, and you didn't have to go to, you know, you know, apprentice under some uh, famous artist for, you know, ten, 10 years or five years or whatever the deal would be, the time you were a kid to learn how to do all this stuff. So it allowed for more people to get out there and paint. And what the impression is, you know, the different, the movement came up was that they were saying, what could I paint? And just doesn't have to be, it still is a painting, even if it isn't, you know, like photorealism, you still know that's a person. And it's just... This is sort of my impression, really, and and uh, I think it was I think, I'm trying to think who was it that coined the phrase um, of, of of what I'm painting. So it was a t totally different loose style, and it, and it's interesting that um, that Bertha did so well with it because originally it was not people didn't like it, they just didn't like it, uh, but nonetheless enough people must have liked it because she was selling her stuff. So that's good. And finally, the French government started to recognize it. Um, there's a true story about um, around 1900, there was a very wealthy doctor from Philadelphia who went over to, uh, to Europe, and it was between, let's see, I think World War I was in 1914, so it was before the war, First World War. And he bought a bunch of um, artwork from uh, Van Gogh and um, Manet, Manet and Monet and um, you know all the greats. And he 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 was a he this doctor he had invented a, a drop that went in babies' eyes that kept them from going blind. It was used all over the world, and he was kind of rich, like Bill Gates rich. Okay, so he bought all this, and he had a friend in high school that was a that knew a lot about art. So then what he did was that he went over and um, to Europe and his friends and said, this is a good painting, that's a good painting. So he gets, and, and so and so again, he had some Van Goghs, some, um, everybody. He, he, got, he got the whole game. So then the Philadelphia Art Museum at the time, apparently, uh, according to his, the, 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 the movie I saw was uh, about this, was run by... Uh, well, let's see, I think they said it was the mob, you know, they just unscrupulous people. And um, he wanted to, but he he, want, he wanted to make, a, you know, show off all his paintings he was so proud of that he bought and had shipped back. And they basically said, you bought junk and you're certainly not going to exhibit any of that stuff in our museum. Well, so he went ahead and built his own museum and the only way you could see his artwork is if you took a six-week, a six-month study course with him, 
to even get to see it. And some of the best artwork of these artists in the world was in his collection, by the way. Very few people got to see it. Well, anyway, so then a few years goes by, and um, fast forward a few years, and now Impressionism is recognized. Um, uh, Picasso's at the top of his game, um, one of the most best-selling artists in the world. Um, every, you know, Van Gogh's dead, but everybody likes his stuff. Um, it's considered great art, and so the museum in Philadelphia asked this guy, if he, I forgot what his name was, if they could, uh, he'd like to do an exhibit. And he said, no, you had your chance, and too bad, tough, nobody's going to see my artwork. And basically his feelings were hurt, and he took it and, and went toys and went home. So there's a movie that you can watch on Netflix, it's called The Art of the Steel. And it's basically how um, this, uh, what happened to his collection, because when he died in the 1950s, this man died, he didn't have any children, and even though he left the paintings in museum and trust, um, eventually the trust got broken. And yet, just recently, in the last 10 years, a new museum has been built in Philadelphia, just down the street from their regular one. And um, and you can see the art, some of the best artwork from all the impressions in the world. If you get a chance to go to Philadelphia, you really want to stop in and see these exhibits, because um, there's something, some of the best artwork of all of them. Well, anyway, that's kind of a you know interesting backstory to how impression got started, what people thought about it. You know, really by the time um, you know World War II happened, you know, um, everybody it was recognized as some of the best artwork ever, and still is. People love it. Uh, Starry Night by Van Gogh is still uh, Van Gogh's work is still the most expensive of any of them. Of any of the artists that sell sold is Van Van Gogh's art still goes for the most money, though. He only sold one painting in his lifetime. So we try to do some of that on YouTube. If you get a chance, I'll iCard this. And uh, we've got some really good examples of art history um, of some of the old dead guys. One guy kindly referred to as the old dead guys, and now I'll have to refer to the old dead gals too, huh? Not just the old dead guys, but the old dead gals. So now you see I'm standing there looking, I'm well, sitting there looking at the painting and see, is there anything else I can do to it? And in your case, you back up or hold it up to a mirror, do something like that. I want you to back away. Look at that. And again, I want to say, I want to thank everybody for um, liking and subscribing to our channel. Uh, please check out some of the fantastic um, old dead guys that we've got on our, 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 our art academy. Um, we've got some beautiful paintings. Um, one cookie lesson, some people think our artwork's too hard, but it really, we, we go from the very beginning, you've never picked up a paintbrush, and it, um, on, when you go to our Academy of uh, Curly Art, Ginger Cook's Academy of Curly Art, um, www.gingercookart.gallery, on the website, our website has got basic how to use a brush, how to hold a brush, how to blend. It will take you basically to never having picked up a paintbrush to um, painting the old masters, so and we've got some beautiful collections more collections of this type of artwork and more detailed and some really good instruction and try us for a week you know 9.95 get your full week over 350 lessons if you want personal art coaching try us for a month um, great instruction and i think you'll find some people we have an art club called the ginger cook acrylic art club on um, youtube and uh, we would, uh, not YouTube, but on Facebook. On Facebook, it's called the Ginger Cook Acrylic Art Club. And we invite you to come over and uh, you know check us out. Uh, show us your show, show show off some of your art. It's a safe place to show art, and it's a good place to see what you know what what others are doing that um, have been very successful with their paintings. And remember, art isn't about talent; it's a, a language. I'm going to say this again: art is a language. It's like learning French or English. It is a quiet language, and it's learnable. It's, talent is um, a good idea. You know, you can't teach that, but it it's fun to do. And the one thing you can do when you're when you're painting is that you don't think it takes you away, kind of transports you to another world, your own world, where you can just focus on color and light and dark and shadow. It's like you like crossword puzzles. Or, you know, like you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, you'll love painting. And think of it like a puzzle. 
where um, where does this piece go? Except you make you paint the piece, and if you you know, that's all you have to do. It's just sit there and turn it upside down occasionally. You see, we're constantly, you know, doing these little corrections all the time. Until I get that painting just the way I want it. I'm lightening up the background a little bit because I had it too dark. And then look again, looking at the lights and darks. So just going another little layer of light over that. Just pull that down, kind of rough it up even more. So the question I'm going to ask you for the comments is. What paintings of some of the old dead guys would you like to see? And if you found any on the internet you'd like us to teach, I'd like to know what those are too. You know, maybe there's somebody, there's some painting that you've seen that you'd really like it. You can either, you can, um, you can show me the painting on our, on, on, on my Facebook page, on our art club. You can say, Ginger, what about this painting? And we're always interested in your input. And what about this painting? If we do that, or you, I'm a member of your academy, and I, I want to challenge myself and do something like this. And, what other lessons would I need to know before I could paint that? Because, you know, everything is sort of like, if, if you're talking about calculus and, and high chemistry, you st still have to learn how to add first, right, and divide. And so there's certain prerequisites to certain paintings. You need to go through steps of learning certain skills in order to do the next skill. But again, I want you to keep in mind the word skill here. It's, it's skill. Okay. Just a skill, only skill. And the final thing is turning on the lights in the dark. So that, see that little bit of white I'm adding to the apple there, making it a little bit lighter. A little bit of highlight there, bring your eye, lighten that up. There you go. Pop a few light. See how much lighter that apple now is than the vase, the glass vase, and, and the handle of the knife, too. You see how the handle of the knife is sort of a gray color compared to the other um, stuff. Now I'm going to just take away the paper here and just uh, look well, I'm going to look at this one more time. It's kind of funny. The top of the vase is an oval. And that seems to be something people have difficulty with. And I'll say again, an oval is a circle that would fit in a business size envelope, so our small, long, thin rectangle. So um, when you're looking at painting something that has an oval top to it, like a vase, um, maybe you need to draw, you know, just put a piece of tracing paper over the, the photograph that you're, you're using to copy from, and then draw a little rectangle, a little skinny rectangle over the oval part of the top of the base. And then look at that and then, then put the oval in it. I think that will really help. Some people get these really big tops. Um, and if you just think it's got to be confined to the skinny thin box, long skinny thin box shape. Okay? And that should help. And then the very end of his little knife right here at the very end. I think that almost looks like a bone knife, doesn't it? Like the bone handle knife. And a tiny light highlight on the top, and you see that line, uh, composition-wise, sends you right to the apple, and then uh, you can skinny up the white line by just adding a little more brown. So that you have a little tiny white line. There you go. Thanks, you guys. I had fun. I hope you did, too. Please let me know what you think. And I think this was a really fun video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.